Hey guys, Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to today's members webinar. Now before we get into the webinar, we're, we're going to be talking a little bit about dash warnings and how you can use dash warnings to save your engine. Just want to cover what's been going on over the last couple of weeks. We have been pretty chaotic around HPA Labs. A reason for that is that we had the first round of the South Island Endurance Racing Championships uh, held on Saturday, just gone. So it's been a pretty busy time for the last couple of weeks getting our Toyota 8 prepped and ready for that particular race. So I just wanted to take you through some of the changes that have been going on then I'll give you a bit of a, a rundown on what happened in that race. Uh, so the very first one that uh, I want to cover off is this steering wheel that I've got sitting in front of me. So this was one of the modifications that we wanted to get done before the endurance round and uh, this is the normal steering wheel that's been on the car for a fair while. However we wanted to add some driver controls and buttons so we'll just uh, get this under our overhead camera and we can switch what we've got there. Uh, so for a start we've just got a basic carbon fibre uh, template that sits behind the steering wheel and this is I think from Track Formula in the UK we, we got this. It's just pre-cut ready for a bunch of different switches. So uh, the, the buttons that we're using here are the pretty popular auto buttons. Uh, so I'll go through the functions that we've got on the dash. So on the top left we've got a latching button here for our pit limiter. Uh, so for all our motors sport in New Zealand we're limited to 40 kilometres an hour while we are in pit lane and uh, if you do end up speeding you're going to get a drive through penalty so pretty costly uh, in terms of your uh, position in a race so we don't want to be speeding. The other thing is with an endurance race in particular uh, during the pit lane entry the driver coming in is concentrating on loosening the belts off getting ready so that it's going to be easier for the next driver to get in so of course watching your speed and accurately controlling that is not not really something that's high on your priority list. So moving down we've got the horn button, uh, pretty useful for stopping people from backing into you in the pits, however this car is going to remain road legal and in New Zealand we do need a horn for the car to be road legal. We've got our alarm reset button over here so uh, this is really going to get into the topic of our webinar a little bit later on which is our driver warnings on our Motec C125 dash so this just allows the driver to reset that warning. We're actually using this for a separate function as well depending whether the button is pressed quickly or whether it's held for more than one second. If it's held for more than one second what it will do is reset the fuel used calculation in the dash. So again this is something that's pretty important for endurance racing. Uh, we are only doing a one hour endurance race but we are only running the factory 50 litre fuel tank in our Toyota 86 so uh, unfortunately 50 litres and one hour of racing don't go well together when we've got a 450 horsepower V8. So it's pretty important for us to be able to monitor the fuel used. That's all calculated via the Motec M150 ECU. It sends the fuel used data through to the dash and based on the fuel in the tank uh, and that fuel used it can calculate the fuel remaining. So a little bit complex there but uh, not too, too difficult to work out. Once you've got that fuel used calculation uh, accurately dialed in uh, it's really, really useful so you know exactly how much fuel is left in the car at any particular point but of course uh, after the pit stop you need to reset that fuel so it's back up to 50 litres. Then on the bottom of the steering wheel on the left hand side we've got uh, a couple of multi position switches, this one on the left here is for our traction control, the one on the right is for launch control. So these uh, allow us to obviously adjust those settings on the fly depending on the track conditions and it's quite difficult sometimes to find great switches for this purpose and one of my pet hates is that a lot of the switches on the market uh, will be sort of 9, 10 or 11 position switches which sounds great in theory but the reality is you don't need that finer control for most of these functions and sometimes less is more so basically we've got four or five positions in, in both of these switches, zero being that that function is completely disabled and then one through to four, one we've got minimal traction control so this is for a really dry track 
track with lots of grip and then of course if we dial that right round to four it's giving really really uh, aggressive traction control for something where there's a lot of standing water on the track and we're also using this uh, in the M150 obviously all this goes through to the M150 ECU and we're using a few modifiers here as well because the uh, calculation that the Motec uses for traction control is a uh, slip percentage between the front and rear uh, wheel speeds and what we've found is that uh, a maybe let's say an 8% slip is quite good for maybe second or third gear but if you get an 8% wheel slip in fifth or sixth gear you're going pretty damn fast and that's a lot of wheel spin and uh, you probably aren't going to want that much wheel slip so uh, we use a gear modifier to dial that back a little bit as we go higher in the gears. Uh, so obviously as, as I mentioned we've got the launch control on the right hand side then we've got scroll and page so this allows us to control uh, what the dash is displaying the information available to the driver and in most instances again we're going to find out more about this during our webinar shortly but in most instances we're probably not going to be taking too much information out of the dash we're really concentrating on driving the car but when something does go wrong this is quite useful now we've got the radio button so we've got radio communication between the driver and the car and our pit team so this just allows information to be relayed both ways in particular the pit team will also have race radio so this is where uh, the race controller can give all of the team's information about what's ha happening on the track if we've got a yellow uh, yellow flag out in a certain area a car off the track maybe a safety car has been called and that information can then be relayed to the driver lastly at the top we've got our lights button and uh, this is going to be used to flash the headlights a number of times automatically if the driver presses it uh, generally used in endurance racing when you're coming up on slow traffic just to make sure that they've seen you uh, with our endurance racing there is a massive variation in the, the lap speed and car speed between the different classes that are combined on track at once so uh, we've got uh, Audi R8 LMS GT3 cars uh, down to relatively stock standard Toyota Starlets and Honda Civics and uh, particularly with some of those faster cars coming up on the slow cars at the end of the long longer straights the closing speed difference is massive and the driver really wants to be able to make sure that the car ahead knows that they're coming up. So that's the uh, steering wheel setup that we've got and one of the problems with adding all of these functions to the dash is getting that information through to uh, the ECU. So the usual way is to use a curly cord to connect to the to the car harness and it obviously allows us still to turn the wheel and yes there are some really trick trick excuse me I'll try and get my words out there are some trick quick release hubs that essentially use an auto sport style connector to pass that through the hub but these are cringingly expensive a little bit beyond what we're trying to do here so uh, we've gone with the curly cord but uh, the problem with using a curly cord like this is when we've got in this case what have we got six uh, digital switches and then we've got two analog voltage inputs there's a lot of wires that need to pass through that curly cord so it ends up pretty bulky and becomes a bit of a wiring nightmare uh, so we've gone with uh, a new product that we hadn't actually had a chance to test before I'll just jump across to my laptop screen for a moment and I'll show you through that uh, so this is the ECU master can switchboard uh, now this little thing is tiny uh, you've got a bit of a sense of scale there from that photo but it measures 25 millimeters square so a one inch square it's tiny absolutely tiny and it takes up to eight switched inputs up to eight analog voltage inputs and then also you can have up to I think it's four uh, low side driven outputs so you could use these for driving low current devices such as LEDs for driver indication uh, or something of that nature and then the advantage is that it converts all of those signals into CAN messages so this means that for your curly cord your connection back to the car you actually only need can high, can low, 12 volts and earth. So uh, through this cord here we've actually only got four wires. Uh, so really really powerful device and I think they're priced under 200 US dollars. So if any of you are thinking about making uh, a steering wheel like this, uh, it is a good option. This isn't a hard sell, we're not selling these products by the way, just a new product that we've 
found that we think is a really, really cool little product for these sorts of uh, tasks. So how that works though, it creates canned messages. So we need to do something with those canned messages so that the ECU can understand it. And this is where, if we were just communicating directly to our M150 ECU, this is actually a little bit tricky because uh, in stock form, in order to get for the likes of the traction control and launch control switches through, the canned message needs to be in a very specific form. So it can't talk directly, in other words, between uh, the ECU master can uh, switchboard and the ECU. Uh, so what we're doing here is that information from the dash is now going into our MoTeC C125 dash. The C125 dash is really, really configurable by the end user in terms of the CAN template. So we can read all of that information in from the switches, the analog voltage inputs, and then we can send out the information in the correct form for our M150 ECU. Now having that information going to the dash also gives us some other advantages because then uh, we can display for the likes of the position of the uh, traction control and launch control status we can we can display that position or setting up on the dash so that the driver knows at a glance what that setting is and the likes of the pit limiter as well we want to be really really sure that the driver knows that that pit limiter is on so uh, we're using a driver message a warning message to say that the pit limiter is on and then on top of that we've also got a shift light module that we're flashing between purple and blue so it's basically impossible for the driver to ignore that so there you go quite a cool little device Device if you are thinking of doing something like that. Now one of the problems with these these auto switches as well is that there's no easy way of terminating to them without the use of solder. Anyone who's been following us for a while knows how we feel about solder but uh, unfortunately while crimping is our preferred technique, in some circumstances there really is no way you can get around using solder uh, no matter what the car and yes you will find some solder in some positions on the likes of F1 and WRC. Uh, but before we get inundated with messages in the comments below, uh, I will just mention that, well, yes, there will be some solder. I'll guarantee you that there's more crimps in a F1 harness than there are solder joints, so that's for sure. Anyway, we'll just have a jump back onto my laptop screen. I'll show you what we've done here uh, to give the harness the best chance of living possible. So obviously this is the back of the steering wheel. Uh, we use 22 gauge uh, Tesla wire for our harness and as you can see there uh, it is all covered in uh, DR25. Now what we've done, once we've soldered the back of those switches we have also installed these little Hellerman uh, heat moldable boots. So what this does is it provides strain relief and support for that wiring and it's the vibration or relative movement that really causes havoc with solder joints. So if we can do our absolute utmost to support those wires and make sure that they're not going to move around. This will give us a long-term reliable result. And we're going to also see that uh, where we've spliced these three wires together, we've used a section of SCL heat shrink over the top again, semi-rigid heat shrink that provides some uh, support. Now what's not visible here as well is once all of this is complete and we're happy with it, uh, the wiring harness isn't just left to flop around on the back of the steering wheel. Uh, it is actually secured to the steering wheel with uh, silicon dis to glue it down and again prevent any relative movement. So there you go, it is possible to get good results with solder uh, and in some instances you're going to have no option. All right, so we've dealt with our steering wheel. Moving along with the race prep again on my laptop screen. Uh, one of the problems with the car when we purchased it is that while it had a roll cage in it, it was built as a street car and the previous owner wanted to make it really easy to get in and out of the car. That's fine on the street, but uh, for actual racing where we've got a field of up to 38, 40 cars uh, all competing at the same time, uh, we really want to prioritise driver safety. So we felt it was pretty important to get a side intrusion bar into the car. So that's exactly what we've got here. Brandon uh, put in a few late nights and managed to piece together uh, the side intrusion. And uh, it's not actually complete here. So there uh, was a panel that went through the centre here once everything was welded up. So uh, happy that that was in there. Glad to also say we didn't need to test it out. Uh, other modifications, we have had some cooling problems that I've dealt with in previous pre-shows here. I'm not going to dive into that too much, but one of the things we did need to do was relocate the air filter and that ended up sitting essentially right behind the front bumper, front bar with very little direct airflow to it and we're finding in testing that even on a cold day we were getting quite a lot of uh, high temperature in inlet air, obviously not what we want 
in terms of making power. So I decided to kind of rip off the Rocket Bunny version 3 front bar a little bit and uh, cut a hole through there. Probably not my finest moment, but uh, it actually does work really well. We're getting a nice cold air, ambient airflow directly into our k and filter mounted behind that. Uh, the other modification that I did briefly talk about in another pre-show was some changes to our fuel system. So as I've already mentioned, we're limited to 50 litres of fuel. Not very easy to add a larger fuel tank. Uh, by our rules for the class, we are allowed up to, I think it's either 110 or maybe 120 litres. Uh, but yeah, getting that into the car without some major modifications really difficult. So what we chose to do was add a dry brake fuel filler. Uh, there's some advantages with doing this as well because uh, in the pit stop if we don't have a dry brake fuel filler, so essentially we're filling through the factory fuel filler, uh, we have to shut the engine down and nothing else can be done on the car while the car is being fueled. Obviously uh, there is a safety precaution there, uh, fuel, fire, not really things that we want in pit lane. So by going to a dry brake there's almost no chance of fuel spillage so this means that we can keep the car running and let's say for example it came with a flat tyre, uh, that wheel could be changed while the car's being fueled. So these are the two parts that we've got here. Uh, this section here goes on our fast fill container and this section here goes into the car. Now in order to get those into the car we did need to make some modifications to the fuel tank itself so uh, Brandon and Alan got pretty busy pulling that tank out and adding a larger uh, feed to fill it but of course it's also just as important to get the air back out of the tank uh, so this is the vent out of the tank unfortunately we couldn't get a two inch vent into the tank it was just not enough room so that does compromise the ability for the system to fill uh, but it still works pretty well so here we've got our five gallon uh, which is about 20 litres of, of fuel in metric with the redhead filler uh, dry brake filler on the top of it and we can put about 20 litres of fuel into the car and I think it's about 10 seconds. So pretty quick, we're dropping about, I think it's about 30 to 40 litres of fuel depending on exactly when the car pits. And it's all nicely hidden behind the factory fuel filler. So uh, really at a glance it all looks just about completely stocked. So we're quite happy with how all of that worked out. Now, I just jumped ahead, but let's have a quick look at how everything panned out for us. So one of the things we were testing as well, and again I've talked about this a little bit, is uh, we do have a MoTeC T2 telemetry system. So uh, this is something we've been wanting to test out for a fair while. Uh, so this works on 3G, so basically this is the receiver that sits in the pits. Uh, we've got a transmitter that sits in the car, and both of them just use a 3G SIM card. So uh, uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages with the 3G system. The other option is to use a radio based transmitter and receiver. Uh, obviously the downside with 3G is it's only going to work well if we've got good cell phone coverage. However, in our first test uh, it did appear uh, to do a pretty good job. So uh, what we'll do is we'll just head across to my laptop for a moment. Um, so this is uh, some screen capture of the car actually out on track uh, during during the race. And what I'll do is actually try and get to a different spot here. Yeah, okay, that'll work. Um, so. Let's just go back to full screen here again. Uh, so some, what we've got here, obviously on the right hand side, we've got our track map. So quite useful because we can see exactly whereabouts the car is on the track at any particular point. And one of the reasons that's important is uh, we don't really want to be distracting the driver while the driver is uh, trying to negotiate corners. So generally, and this is a reason, we have to contact the driver straight away. Uh, we try and keep communication to the front straight with a little bit more time to breathe and a little bit more time to think about things. Uh, so at the top we've got that fuel remaining which is what I was talking about here so we know exactly how much fuel's left in the car. Now how we were using this telemetry though was, was quite interesting. Uh, it, as you can see at the moment the little live cursor is sort of scrolling across the screen in real time uh, and the grey line that you can see on the data at the moment is a reference lap. So we're actually using this for live driver coaching while uh, Ben was out on the track uh, I was able to basically look at what he was doing compared to the 
reference lap and you can straight away see areas where there's potential for picking up a little bit of lap time so really really powerful the other thing that uh, we were looking at here uh, down the bottom a little bit hard to see in detail but we've got all of our temperatures and we were having up until now we were having some problems keeping uh, things such as the diff the gearbox and the engine cool uh, obviously not ideal for an endurance car so we've done a lot of work on that we were able to monitor all of those aspects we can see in a little bit more detail here we've got our engine oil temperature and our diff oil temperature so you can set up alarms right here in the telemetry system so that whoever's watching that telemetry uh, is going to be uh, notified if something goes out of the normal operating range so uh, really quite a uh, powerful system and uh, we're excited to get into this in a little bit more detail we feel like we're only scratching the surface now so we're bring, bringing you a bit more information on this as we get a little bit more involved uh, right so the other thing I wanted to show you though is the first lap of our race didn't quite go to plan I started Ben uh, did the second stint and uh, started from grid position 15 out of a class of I think there was about 38 cars on track and it is a rolling start so of course uh, first lap you've got cold tyres you've got cold brakes there's a lot going on and it gets pretty busy going going into the first turn. So I'll just play a quick video here which is uh, what happened on that first lap. So let's hit that now. Alright, so obviously a pretty busy first lap. Now that I've actually played that, I'll just go back and sort of narrate what was actually going on here. So uh, coming down the front straight, basically as soon as the lights turned green, uh, there was a BMW E46 right beside me over here on the right hand side. And unfortunately it had a bit more power than that BMW, so I managed to pretty easily pull in front of him. Uh, the silver car in front of me there is a an Audi TCR race car, and then there's the orange cars at Janetta. So I was pulling in the Audi reasonably quickly coming into the braking zone. Decided again, first lap, wasn't really trying to be a hero. You can't win a race on the first corner of the first lap for an endurance race, but you can certainly lose it. So I decided to just uh, go a little bit light on the braking there and fall in behind him. However, as we can see, uh, obviously didn't have a lot of heat into the rear tyres on that TCR and got completely out of shape right in front of me. And this is where there's a lot going on in a split second. You've got to make up your mind as to what what's going to happen. Initially I did think about going to the outside and you can see I do move the car out to the right hand side. Pretty quickly realised that he was actually going to spin and come straight back across the front of me. So at this point lifted out of the throttle. Now what may or may not have been apparent uh, in that video when I played it in real time is that the BMW E46 that I had passed, a little bit more enthusiastic uh, into the braking zone than I was, maybe wasn't paying attention to what was going on in front and about that point right there he hits me in the back quite hard as it turns out so that's why I've got a handful of opposite lock on so he had race radio come across which hopefully we're, we're, able, we're able to hear there and uh, straight away as soon as I got hit basically we can see we've got this warning comes up on the dash here. So this actually brought up a uh, low fuel pressure warning. So we'll talk again a little bit more about that later into the webinar. So uh, yeah, pretty busy first lap. Not uh, the best start to the race, but fortunately the, there wasn't too much damage to our car. However, uh, this is the front of the E46. Unfortunately, he ended up having to retire uh, after that first lap, so it didn't actually end up completing a single lap. So not the ideal way to start a four-round endurance race series. Uh, for us, though, pretty successful. We ended up getting to the end, which really was our only aim. We were never uh, going to be in a position to win, uh, but we ended Ended up coming fourth in our class and we learned a hell of a lot but most importantly we all had a lot of fun so we've got our second round coming up next weekend so uh, stay tuned and we'll bring you a little bit more information uh, about that once we get through it. 
Uh, now, I also just wanted to take you through and show you the latest, or it's actually not the latest video, this is a video that we released uh, last week. Didn't have a webinar last week, so I wasn't really able to talk about it. Uh, but this is from our visit to Goodwood uh, Festival of Speed. After we were at Goodwood, we toured around and one of the places we had on our radar was visiting uh, Radical Sports Cars. And Radical, I've actually had a bit of experience with tuning some Radicals that have been imported to New Zealand. Uh, I've been a long time fan of the RPE V8 which is a Suzuki Hayabusa based V8. It uses the cylinder head off the 1300cc Suzuki Hayabusa engine uh, as well as the, uh, the cylinder barrels and then it uses a bespoke cast aluminium crank, uh, crankcase as well as a special flat plane crankshaft and uh, basically they produce a different variety of, of capacities but uh, their uh, higher spec engine produces 500 horsepower from uh, a fairly diminutive capacity also weighs next to nothing so we get the chance to talk to James from a Radical Sports Cars about what goes into the design and development of that engine. Uh, this particular video has gone pretty crazy by HPA standards. We're over 200,000 views now and uh, got a lot of comments on there. So if you haven't seen it already, uh, make sure you jump on and check it out. And uh, if you aren't already subscribed to our channel, please make sure you do so. This way you won't miss out on any of our videos. We release new videos every week. All right, thanks for joining us there and uh, please stay tuned. We'll get stuck into our webinar very shortly.